Hello and welcome to another episode of the Smart Attack Podcast. My name is Nick, the EMF guy, Pino. I'm here with Andy Mont. And Andy is the founder and CEO of Lublox, which is a company specializing in evidence-based advanced light filtering eyewear. And I swear this is not just an episode to talk about blue blocks, but I am using blue blocks in the evening and during the day. So I have full disclosure. I'm an affiliate for blue blocks. I love their products, but I'm here with Andy because Andy, you have the expertise to talk about it. You've been on the EMF Hazard Summit, and I wanted to do a longer interview with you because uh, when I talked with you on the summit, it was about 15, 20 minutes, we got into the basics of blue light. I want to do a two-parter, and now we're going to dive into what is the problem with, re- with blue light. So in the next 30 minutes or so, let's just establish uh, if pe- someone listening to this video slash audio has no idea what we're talking about blue light, why, why is blue light a problem? So that's my, fir- my first question for you. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate the introduction. And yeah, just to reiterate what you were saying, this isn't an episode all about uh, trying to push products on people. Um, we're education first and, um, you know, wherever people find the, the products to suit their light hygiene requirements is totally fine with, with us. And, and we just want to provide the information to people to be able to, you know, um, critically assess the products that they, they want to buy to improve their light hygiene. So, um, yeah, no, I appreciate that, Nick. Um, so um, the first question, um, what was the first question again, Nick, just there? Was it well, to... blue light, what's the problem? Blue light, like, what is the like, problem? Yeah, ab- what absolutely. Is, what is the problem? How does it yeah. impact our health? Yeah, it's a, a re- very broad question. I could talk yep. for hours on, on what, why <laughs> blue light is a problem. I think the first thing to caveat is that context needs to be applied, right? Sure. So blue light in itself isn't an issue, okay? It depends what source... Um, is giving out the blue light and at what time of the day so by that what I mean is we we all have a circadian rhythm okay we we developed these millions of years ago through our evolution and it was all synced to light and dark cycles with the sun now the sun gives out natural light a lot of blue light during the day which makes us feel alert and awake and that is perfect that is so good for our rhythms all the hormonal processes and biological processes within our body and as the sun set all blue light disappeared, the campfire was lit and red light was present. And that signaled to the body, time to go to bed, time to reduce cortisol, increase melatonin, get a good rest, recover, ready for the next day for the hunt and gather or whatever it it, it was our ancestors were doing. Our circadian rhythm has remained somewhat unchanged for millions of years. But what has changed is the environment we live under. So we now live under these uh, like alien artificial suns in the form of LED and fluorescent lighting. And the composition of light within those devices um, and LEDs and and fluorescent lights is very different to what our circadian rhythm is used to, aka from the sun. Um, So what it does is it it basically sends wrong signals to the brain Mm. and the circadian rhythm telling us that perhaps when we're watching TV at nine o'clock in the evening, that it's the middle of the day. So we need to keep cortisol levels high and keep melatonin levels low which isn't the natural sync cycle that we're in um, from a circadian standpoint, which basically means we wreak havoc with our hormones over time. We become sleep deprived over time. We don't get good sleep, so we don't recover as well. And all this is tied into mitochondrial like degeneration. Um, And then when that happens is you start to get all these metabolic type, um, biological type issues, such as, you know, insulin resistance. So you gain a lot of weight. Um, Alzheimer's, um, stress, anxiety, depression, some cancers sometimes can be exacerbated by this kind of lighting. So just to summarize, there is there is good and and bad blue light. The good blue light is all this natural sunlight and um, the dark cycles that are synced to our circadian rhythm. And then we got this junk light, which is um, from artificial sources, which is very high in blue light, which is sending signals to our brain and circadian rhythm all the time telling us that it's the daytime so our rhythms can't sink and then our hormones get messed up and we become sick. Yeah, and um, I'm a very poor host, I realized, because I didn't even give proper context with this interview. Why are we talking about blue light? Blue light is a type of EMF, guys. It's it's actually very underrated and it, it's so underrated that, I mean, I, I kind of call myself the EMF guy and I miss blue light. I I considered including blue light in my book, The Non-Tenfold Guide to EMFs, and then I... 
didn't have really the patience to dive into the topic. So it's quite unfortunate that it didn't, did not address it. But in the EMF spectrum, well, light, visible light and invisible light spectrum is there just in the higher frequencies. Like the visible light spectrum starts around, uh, it's more than 400 thousand gigahertz so a lot of people are like oh 5g is very high frequency and it's dangerous and 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 brian hoyer my colleague on electro pollution fix of the course we've created together is like well if it's all a matter of frequency then visible light is more dangerous than 5g right so it's not a matter of frequency it's a matter of how artificial a certain signal is so when you're exposed to all these screens and if i do that and just stare at a screen with eyes wide open uh, I'm in the evening and and the, <laughs> the other the other side of the world. So you're in Australia. So it's uh, in the morning for you. It's 7 p.m. for me. So it's sending my eyes and and skin also all these receptors a lot of signals saying that it's the wrong time. So essentially, what what do do you agree with me that essentially we're we're getting jet lagged in a sense in a very uh, bizarre sense, we're getting jet lagged when we have the capability to expose ourselves to all these artificial light sources in um, at, at night and with the wrong timing. Is that correct? Yeah, that correct absolute, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, it's very well put. And there is actually a, a term that's been coined called social jet lag, um, which, is, um, which is when people burn the candle at both ends. So they go out late at night, get bad sleep, have to get up early to work in a nine to five environment. Um, and then they become socially jet lagged, which basically means their body clock is out of sync. And social jet lag can actually happen with, with the incorrect lighting environment as well. Um, you know, what you've got to sort of remember is that we have thousands and thousands of little clocks in our body. Every cell has a little clock in it that ticks in a 24 hour cycle. And each day, those clocks are reset by environmental stimuli, mainly light, sometimes food, cold environment, seasonality, but they're synced every day. So if your clock is slowly being, you know, tuned in incorrectly every day, you're going to slowly experience this feeling of jet lag because your environment outside is telling you, oh, it's, it's, it's this time of the day and, and I should be doing this. And then you're going in under artificial lighting. It's telling you it's another time of the day. It's almost like flying through different time zones. And people know how that feels if you get on a, you know, a long haul flight and oh, yeah. get off the other side. It takes you days to get used um, to, to adjust to it and resync the body clock. And there's loads of tips um, on my website about how to beat jet lag and overcome it within about 24 hours. Um, there's lots of hacks you can do with light to try and sync that depending on what direction you're traveling in but yeah this this whole jet lag feeling is 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 what people are experiencing that 3 p.m crash that um you know waking up feeling tired in the morning when you know from an evolutionary standpoint that should not be occurring and when you start to sync your circadian rhythm correctly by some very simple free and cheap hacks you can actually start feeling a lot better in the morning. You feel like, wow, I can jump out of bed. I want to get out of bed. I need to see the sunrise rather than feeling groggy in the morning and then wired before you go to bed. And part of that feeling is brought about by, by light at the wrong times of the day. So what we've seen is that when you start having incorrect blue light exposure, so by that, I mean, you're, you're exposing yourself to minimal art, uh, minimal sunlight during the day yeah. and uh, intensification of, of blue light, artificial light from TVs, lights, fridges, cell phones after sunset, you actually reverse your cortisol cycle. Um, and what that does is when you wake up in the mor morning, you should have a natural cortisol awakening response. It's called from a scientific standpoint. So in the morning, the sunrise will trigger this release of cortisol, which will basically be like a jump start, like a defibrillator to your body in the morning where you're just like, bang, straight out of bed and awake and alert. And that's how people should be feeling. But 99% of people don't. Um, and then in the evenings, the cortisol just dips down to almost non-existent levels. So we're not pent up. We're not you know, active. And with, with the cortisol levels going down, you start to feel more relaxed and you can sleep better. But it reverses when over a period of time, if you have the wrong type of art, uh, wrong type of light during the day and artificial light in the evening. So you get low cortisol levels in the morning, hence you feel really shitty getting out of bed. And then in the evenings, you might be tired all day through, through work. And then you get home in the evening, switch on the TV and you're wired and don't want to go to sleep. That continues over a long period of time you can have chronic levels of cortisol in your body where you start to feel stressed all the time, tightly wound. And if it continues even longer, 
anxiety and depression will start to um, start to occur. And you can see this today in younger and younger populations, like teenagers having anxiety because they've been brought up with iPads in their face from two years old and upwards. So, the, you know, I, I started looking at, you know, high def screens probably when I was 15, 16 years old. So I've had 20 years of this, um, uh, you know, kind of technology. Luckily, I've, I've mitigated it in the last five or six years. But to say 20 years for someone to use this technology to become, you know, perhaps depressed or anxious of our, my generation. I mean, I'm 37. I, I started looking at, you know, I could start to feel depressed now, 20 years time. I mean, I don't fortunately because I manage light. But if a kid starts looking at this at two years old, by the time they're 15 or 20 years old, they're going to start to feel anxious because it's that they're seeing this technology and seeing this light at such a young age that it's messing them up, you know, in the same time frame that they're just using it earlier. So, yeah, very, very dangerous, this this blue light, artificial blue light epidemic that we're in. Yeah, it is. So it's fundamental, just like EMF exposure, um, nutrition, grounding, meditation, uh, sleep is fundamental. So, I mean, if you impair sleep 10%, you can reduce longevity by by quite a bit. I mean, it's, it's hard to um, quantify these things. But what I like about blue light uh, in what I like, I guess, what I appreciate about it is that it's becoming so mainstream that, you know, even Apple a few years ago put the night shift uh, option on their phones. Uh, it's becoming more mainstream because my uh, my eye doc uh, that it has not, let's say, a holistic perspective, anything like that, just very regular eye doctor mainstream. I went to the eye doctor two years ago and told me, oh, you have to get blue light filters on your glasses. And it was like, pardon me? Like, really, you're telling me about blue light? Are you a biohacker or something? And, and it turns out, and I asked just kind of playing a little bit, uh, playing stupid a little bit, said, uh, oh, yeah, well, what is this about? Where, you heard, where, where have you learned that? Oh, well, we have uh, eye doctor conferences in the States, and they're, they're from uh, Montreal, the eye doctors. So they go internationally to the States and, and, and study this with other eye doctors. And they said, it's, it's completely established that uh that it's linked with macular degeneration and i saw in the science i tried to review the science a little bit and as some people argue is it linked is it not linked but what we know at least is that everyone like it's something like more than 99 percent in south korea have myopia and that a lot of people have bad eyesight so it's probably not helping it's probably one of the reasons one, one other reason might be we're staring in a stationary screen and not looking afar and using our eyes the way they should be used but just to mention something that is quite credible also that what i like about blue light is this iarc uh decision international agency for research on cancer july 5th that says the night shift work with circadian disruption is uh probably carcinogenic to humans that's huge that's a group 2a so it means if you're a night shift worker uh don't freak out but it is it is a marker for a more difficult health on a health standpoint it's just a fact so it, it tells you that when you disrupt the circadian rhythm you can increase your cancer risk so that's something but also your short-term wellness but then uh, something else i wanted to cite as far as the study goes there's these are going to be in the show notes i, I found it a little bit funny because Sometimes this is this is how researchers write about things. <laughs> anyway, it's just I the title of that study is IR 2019. Night shift work is probably carcinogenic. And then they said dot dot dot. What about this term chrono chronobiology in all walks of life? And they kind of said, uh, wait a minute. This decision means that people with screwed up circadian rhythms have uh, a greater cancer risk. But what about all of biology, like everything living on this planet, including bugs and animals that are exposed to all these crazy LEDs they just installed in Montreal two years ago. So it's a big question. And I find it funny because it's kind of, they ask a question, but we know it's going to take kind of 30 years until it becomes policy. So it's very damning for me, but it shows you that all of biology is impacted. And that's pretty clear because all of biology has uh, circadian rhythms, right? They, I mean, even nocturnal animals would have the opposite rhythm and things like that, but it's, it's, it's so fundamental. So we're right in the middle of this explosion of studies around blue light. Is there other, um, other streams of research that you've seen increase in the last years? I know there's the cancer one, there's 
it, what about the sleep deprivation? Do we have good studies on, I don't know, people who stare at a screen or don't or use blue blockers? Like, is, is this being researched more than anecdotes and biohackers talking about it nowadays? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's been a lot of studies in the last sort of four or five years on, on that, and especially in um, sleep deprivation and sports performance. Oh, okay. um, that's been very, um, very highly studied um, for obvious reasons. The, the elite sort of level athletes typically um, get that tr special treatment first. And, you know, we're seeing studies that have shown, you know, I think it was something like a 10% decrease in sprint speeds from one night of sleep deprivation. I think it was like two hours sleep deprivation. Um, marathon runners have been um, uh, assessed with sleep deprivation and found their performance um, basically reduced uh, by, by significant amounts from sleep deprivation. There's also a really interesting study that came out about six, seven years ago. And, and drop me an email if you want me to send these over to you sure. um, as yeah. well. Just um, give me a list of what I'm saying. So I forget otherwise, and I'll flick them over because they're all I'm on our website. <laughs> no yeah, there was a really good one that showed that... Um, people that um, sleep in, don't sleep in total darkness have higher blood sugar levels than those and insulin resistance than those who sleep in complete darkness. Um, so that was a really interesting study. Um, and there's, there's, there's sort of multiple ones that are, um, that are out there as well that I can send over on, on various other aspects as well. A lot has been done in, in ADHD with children um, and artificial light in impacting them as, as well. So. Yeah, it's, 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 it's literally, I, I, I go on PubMed and just have a, an account with those guys. And, and every time a study is released, um, I get an, an alert in my inbox. So I always encourage people to do that. It's a free account and you get studies sent to you and you're like, oh yeah, I'll read that one. But it's interesting you mentioned about animals because a lot of the studies are on animals as, as well. Um, those ones I just mentioned more on humans, but you know, there's a lot saying that you know, nighttime LEDs and street lamps, like disrupting migratory birds and um, nesting habits and, you know, the amount of offspring they're having and the ones that are surviving and that they disappear from certain areas. So um, that's really interesting as well. We, we have um, have a magpie that sits outside of uh, our, um, our, our house and uh, literally about three in the morning every morning is just crowing and it's just like is that normal like it should be it shouldn't it's not a nocturnal bird it should be out during the day and it's just like chirping at three in the morning every morning so um there's definitely something um you know missed there when it comes to disrupting their circadian rhythms as well and, and things have to be looked at from that perspective too not just from a human perspective because as you rightly said every thing on this planet has a circadian rhythm whether it's a you know, uh, like ours, um, you know, active during the day or, or whether it's uh, the reverse for, for a nocturnal species. Yeah. And it's, again, it's damning. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a guy who wants to stay on the cutting edge. I'm very, one of my biggest frustration in life, I think, in my professional life, at least, is seeing something that is extremely clear in the data and looking at scientists. I'm not a scientist myself. I can look at studies and I can, I, I can, do my best but i i count on scientists that are saying guys this is a real issue we're seeing the data is pretty clear now we have a two-way car carcinogenicity at iarc for um at, at least people that are night shift worker and then what i i see that and in the meantime they're drilling holes and putting new blue light madness in the street and and i read that on the screen and then i see that and and i'm like Guys, what don't you understand? So it means that the mayor of Montreal is not reading these, th these studies. And, and, and the, the irony here is uh, in the Journal of Montréal, that is a, a local um, newspaper here, I, wrote an, uh, I, I read an article that said we're installing, uh, we basically, they paid, I don't know, $6 million to replace everything with LEDs. And they used to have these amber glowing kind of like great colored uh, street lamps and everything is replaced with floodlights that i mean it it could power the entire football it, it football field or it could be the equivalent of that it's like friday night lights boom so it's completely mad and you have researchers from the university i think it's mcgill or university of montreal that said uh, and they are researchers in blue light and circuit and rhythm they said well this is the opposite of what you want to be doing considering the science 
So it's very maddening that uh, just like when it comes to EMF, the science is pretty clear. We should not install all these towers near these, near these people, but we're kind of left, we're kind of left navigating this with a lot of frustration. I see that uh, at least there's some move in the right direction, but in the meantime, they're still moving the wrong direction. So it's very frustrating. Even even with screens, I I, I figured, have you seen any screen or any um, tech product that is now by default a little bit less intense when it comes to the blue light? Is there improvement or it's more like, <laughs> eh, we still like these glowing like retina screens that are like, like yeah. burning your retina, right? It's I know, like yeah. That, right? It's dreadful, yeah. I know it's um, it's it's so hard to find, and and the thing is, it's like what you said. The the science is clear in a lot of things, right? The science is very clear with with blue light. The science is very clear with EMF. The science is very clear with with COVID nineteen. Yet we all do the, you know, the governments do the do the opposite. The, the companies do the complete opposite to what the science says, and it it frustrates the more critical thinkers like yourself and, and, and I and, and probably the majority of your listeners in so much that the data's there and it's just being ignored and it's it's unfathomable why. Um, but, you know, like the TVs, for instance, like why would they put that in there? You know, people want crisp, clear colours and, you know, they don't care about the, the health benefits, you know, and then, you know, there's, there's knock-on effects with the floodlighting, like you, you mentioned. Like, I see why they're doing it. They're doing it maybe from a security standpoint, yeah, you know, probably. to stop crime or something like that. But then they're not thinking of the knock-on effect that that could have as, as well. And, and, you know, I think, I think unfortunately, a lot of the, the policymakers in, in any country in the world um, are, are a bit like general practitioners when it comes to doctors. They're, they're, they're generalists. They know a little bit about everything, but they really aren't a master of anything at all. So, um, you know, what, what we would prefer to see in governments is maybe more specialization or, or more external consultant, consultative advice to governments um, in, in people's fields of study to be able to make the right decisions. Because no one's saying don't put the floodlights out there. They just, you know, need to have, you know, the data that says if you do that, yeah, your prime rate will drop by 10 percent, but your life expectancy in your country or your hospital beds um, occupied by cancer patients or, you know, Alzheimer's treatments will go through the roof in 30 years time. But I guess it's, you know, believe it or not, whatever people's stance is on, on global warming. It's one of those things where it's just like, well, we can't see, really see the effects at the moment. So is it really happening? Um, unless it's like a problem right in front of someone right now, um, they typically don't see it. And it's true with blue light. Like, you know, like for instance, if you, if you felt really, if you were really overweight, right, you gained a lot of weight um, and you were like, something's not right here. I shouldn't be this weight. What's the first thing you do? You, go, you turn to a diet and exercise. Um, if, you, if you manage to continue that on, which a lot of people won't do, you'll lose weight and you'll feel better. Why? Because you're exercising and you're putting nutritious food in your body. But until you get to that point, like I always say that the, the obese people in, in this world are the lucky ones because they've got symptoms of not feeling very well, okay? And they can then go and address it a little bit easier. But it will be the likes of people that think they're in shape, maybe they're not, not obese um, and they just feel a certain way. They're the unlucky ones because they just think, well, this is normal. This is how I should feel. I'm not overweight, so there's nothing wrong there. I just feel tired all the time. Maybe I'm getting older. When in fact, you've got to try light hygiene management to then see what normal actually feels like when you're living under the correct circadian rhythm. Because until you do that, you won't know anything's wrong until 30 years later, you go to the doctors and you're diagnosed with stress, hypertension, diabetes, anxiety, um, cancers, or whatever it may be, when you could have actually gone back and just tried some of these free hacks that we can talk about perhaps in, in the second episode yep. um, of what people can do to mitigate these, these issues now, but also to compare how they feel. And I'm always the one to say, you know, what have you got to lose by, you know, I'll give five or six free things people can do to instantly feel better with light management in the next episode. And, you know, why not try that for a month? What's it, what have you got to lose? And if you don't feel any better, then fine, just, just do what you want to do. But I guarantee you, you know, 99 out of 100 people do these free hacks will be like, oh my God, 
yeah. I was definitely not right circadian rhythm wise now and now like I'm going to do this and I'm going to explore like more and I'm going to feel amazing so um, it, you don't know something's wrong until you try an alternative way so it's always about self-experimenting and you know that's kind of what biohacking is all about like people think biohackers are jumping in cold lakes and sticking stuff up their nose and taking nootropics and stuff like that and it's not the case it's it's literally just trying to hack the environment and biology to make yourself feel better and that can be from dieting it can be from exercise it can be from light it can be from emf it can be from wellness mental health so um you know don't be afraid of the term biohacking people that are listening to this it, it can be as as light or as an, or as extreme as as you want but worth doing to experiment on yourself safely to make yourself feel better and, and optimize your life really that's that's perfect, Andy. I, I agree a hundred percent. And uh, I'm a self experimenter myself. I can tell you um, in the next episode we're gonna talk about solutions. I'm gonna tell you an anecdote. The first time I had blue blockers on, and these were not the these are the yellow tinted. I use them in front of the computer, but the orange, very dark tinted ones. <laughs> the first night I put them on and tried to watch a movie, my wife uh, never falls asleep during a movie. If I wear blue blockers, I always fall asleep. So I, I, I saw the night and day difference, pun intended, to be, between before and after in my ability to stay awake during a movie. So it's not practical, but I saw a difference. So I tested it out for myself. And then, uh, of course, when I wear the, the blue blockers and I'm at a, at a party and it's 10 p.m., I'll fall asleep on the table. So in certain situations, I do not want them, but for sure, I can tell you that they worked for me. We're going to pause there in the next episode in two weeks time. If you're listening to this as it is released on the Smart Attack, we're going to have Andy back. This time, we're going to talk about solutions. The blue blockers, should we use curtains? Should we use eye masks, everything? Um, melatonin, maybe. I don't know what's your opinion on this. So, Andy, we're going to be back uh, on the next episode of Smart Attack. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, it was an honor. Please mention at least uh, where can people find you. And I know we also have a uh, coupon code that people can use. So I'll mention that right afterwards. So, where, where can people find blue blocks? Yeah, blueblocks.com. So B L U B L O X dot com or punch it into Google B L U B L O X and you'll find us. Um, so yeah, come check us out there. The um, learn section is full of studies and articles on everything related to, you know, blue light, EMF, um, red lights, all sorts of different things. And also our blog section has articles. If you go all the way back to the beginning, um, they're a little bit more sort of complex. And then the more recent ones are a little bit more basic. So depending on what you want, either start at the beginning or, or start at the end and work back one way or the other. So um, yeah, that's the best way to find that definitely. And I can, I can add something. Your videos on YouTube are especially good okay. because they're short and sweet and uh, you're a great speaker. You're able to really summarize things, make things very simple and understandable, even the hard complex science. So I really appreciate those videos. Uh, sometimes, uh, most of the time I watch them myself. You're, you're among uh, the, the short list of people that I will constantly listen to. That's true. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. just to just flatter you. And you can use, by the way, blueblocks.com. So B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com for blue blockers and a lot more. They're really uh, pioneers in your light diet. Uh, that's, that's how I would put it. Use Nick, N-I-C-K 15 for 15% off. Uh, hopefully that still works. It's going to be in the show notes. So in the meantime, stay healthy. I'll see you next time for Smart Attack. Andy, thanks again for being here. Thanks, Nick.